the time this evening to <clears throat> excuse me attend this first CONFOR webinar in England. Um, basically, this is part of our strategy to try and, um, I'm saying this, it's not my tongue in my cheek, but to try and uh, reach a wider membership. Um, basically, it's a ta tactic we've used in Scotland to some success. And in my previous role in the public sector, I was always desperate to get the outputs of research to, to a wider field. So uh, in this new role as Deputy Chief Exec of CONFOR, um, I'm hoping that uh, Caroline and myself as as Team England, as we call ourselves, uh, just to make, make it clear though, Caroline is the manager. I'm the wee guy that comes on with the oranges and the, the, the magic sponge if, if required. But uh, it's certainly we, we plan if successful to have a series of these webinars uh, looking at uh, technical aspects of, of the supply chain and skills, innovation, etc. But uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes tonight and we'll work on a program for next year. Protocol for this evening. Um, most of you are already uh, doing that anyway, but if you could turn off your, your cameras and mics, if you're not speaking for the time being, it just saves any blips with bandwidth, etc. cetera. Uh, when it comes to uh, asking questions, etc., cetera, uh, please uh, raise your hand, which I believe is up in the top right hand corner. If you up in the the band there, if you where the little dots are, if you click it, you'll see raise hand. You can raise your hand there, or if you like, use the chat setting and ask questions there, and uh, I'll be able to read them and then ask the speakers to respond in due course. So the first um, topic that we've, we've aimed at is, I suppose, at the start of the supply chain, and that's looking at tree breeding. Um, we have a, a really a fantastic lineup here. Uh, we've got Gustavo Lopez. Joe Clark and Tim Widden. And uh, I think we're going to start with Gustavo, who is head of tree breeding. And he's going to take us through some work that he's doing on looking at how we can improve the stiffness of Sitka spruce. But he's also, I think, now promised if he has time, he'll maybe just touch on uh, eucalyptus. But it's maybe a topic that we can bring him back to talk in a more expansive mode uh, at a later stage if he gets the green light to do research on there at Forest Research. So Gustavo, would you like to kick off with your presentation? Thank you. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. It was on. Try sharing your screen again. You should be able to. I, I have it in, in my laptop. Mm -hmm. If you go up to the top in the center there, in the green button, share screen. Click on that. Okay. Can, can you see now? Uh, no, no. Now? Not yet, no, not seen anything at all. Okay. Perhaps we are not sharing my, my screen. Show video, no. Share the screen. Okay, I think that's now. We are starting again. That's it. It's coming now, Gustavo. That's you. That's it. If you're going to, if you're going to show, no, no, we give the full screen. Okay. That's it. Is it okay? That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will talk about improving stiffness in 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 Sitka spruce, and so most of the soft food in the UK is aimed to go to the sawmill uh, to produce timber, uh, mainly Sitka spruce, 
is, is the, the business of the Sitka spruce is to produce uh, structural timber. And the rest, the, the small pieces or the, 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 the timber that, the, the wood that can go not to timber goes to different minor uh, use. But for grading the timber uh, uh, in the UK, we are based in three parameters, which are stiffness, strength, and density. So if we see the, the table that really grade the timber, um, we may see that, for instance, if we are talking about the grade in C16, uh, for instance, you need to have at least and a stiffness of eight and a strength of 16 and a density of 310. So are you following me? So for the case of Sitka, uh, the density is, is 338 uh, kilos per cubic meter. So it's, it's in the C2022, 20, which is good, but the strength it's, it's is get stuck in the C20. And if we see stiffness, stiffness really is the weaker point because it's the limiting factor really to upgrade the, the timber of Sitka spruce is in C16. So um, in, in the last years, forest research have been uh, recognizing the, this problem of stiffness and, and, and was trying to evaluate stiffness into the breeding population. Stiffness, uh, it doesn't have too much variation that really justify or uh, compensate to, to improve stiffness. So there are uh, some evidence that uh, stiffness is varied between provenance in a, in a paper that was published in, in Ireland. And so we decided to uh, do an examen of stiffness across the, the natural distribution of the species in, in a trial that was planted in, in 1974 in the north of Scotland in Farigate, which include 25 provenance from the Alaska to the north of Oregon, to the south of Oregon, including Queen Charlotte Island. So the, the, the plot got more than 200 trees. And we select the, the top plus trees, nine plus trees, and we were assessing by resonance uh, stiffness. So we found, surprisingly, that there was no a regional pattern or a clinal variation for a stiffness. So it doesn't vary from south to north or north to south. But the beauty was that uh, actually, if you remember, uh, as Sitka spruce is C16 because the, the stiffness is 8.2. And we found a few trees which are almost over 9.5, which is C20. So the, the, this is a, a really a good, a, a good move on. Uh, so we, we found that there is a, a weak correlation between stiffness and growth, but still we can find some trees. It will be a bit challenger to to improve the, the variation uh, for improving the stiffness, but we, we found a few trees which are really very good for stiffness. So also it will be challenging to, to try to break this uh, negative correlation between growth and stiffness, but we detect a lot of trees which are really good for growth and stiffness. And so we decided to work uh, out all the, the trial and develop a subline, a superior subline or elite subline for stiffness, which 
in, in the future, the, the aim is try to introduce uh, within the breeding population. In top of that, if we include more different uh, uh, trees from different provenance, it will increase the genetic variation. And in some way, that will help to the resilience to climate change because it is expected that we will rise up a bit the temperature and uh, also the, the summer will be a bit hotter. And also it will stress in some way the, the pest and disease tolerance. So we found that breathing to improve stiffness uh, looks quite promising. Uh, in top of that, there are uh, two works where, that say that stiffness is highly irritable, which make relatively easy to introduce stiffness into the in, into the breeding population, and also a, a weak point that we have is that a, a, the accurate assessment of stiffness really require mature trees. Uh, that's that is the is, is in some ways is such a, a long term objective, but we've been working in the last four years in genomic selection, trying to detect uh, molecular markers which are related to stiffness. So that's really will improve the timber quality uh, and it, it, it sounds to be possible. So increase the competitiveness of uh, the British Sitka um, growth it's our objective and it will continue delivering healthy and wealthy plantation in the future. Um, so I think that th there are a lot of people involved in this project, uh, but actually the, the kickoff was done by Joelis from Forestry and Land Scotland. And that's most of the presentation about Sitka. And so I think that I have a few more minutes and I will talk that I, I, I did my PhD in Australia and I get very familiar with eucalyptus. And if we see Brazil in 1970, they were growing about 12 cubic meter per hectare year and after breeding, they reach in, in 45 years, 400% more growth. So up to 50 cubic meter per hectare year. Something similar happens in, in, in China. In China in the 90s, the, the, the trees were growing seven cubic meter per hectare year. And after 20 years of uh, breeding and adjust the silviculture, they overpass the, the 25 cubic meter per hectare year. So if we think in the, in, in the UK, well, there are more than 700 species of eucalyptus. And if we see in, in, the, in the UK from the south to the north, eucalyptus glaucescens is the top grower in the UK. And in the native uh, distribution of eucalyptus glaucescens, it grow a really very high altitude, which really make strong to support very low temperatures. And most of the uh, native area of eucalyptus glaucescens is in, in natural areas which are protected as national parks which make relatively easy to explore all the, the genetic background that eucalyptus glaucescent is having. So we have a proposal for breeding, a breeding program for eucalyptus glaucescent using the, the full variation, natural variation, 
with the aim to produce biomass. And we are expecting that the, uh, after breeding, we may generate a, an improving growth between 50 to 100% more. And in top of that, we may adjust the management, which also will contribute to improve the growth. And that's for me. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Gustavo, uh, for two very interesting uh, presentations. And um, quite diverse as well, Sitka spruce and then eucalyptus. Do we have any uh, questions for Gustavo? Uh, please um, raise your hand. None, none at the moment, I can see. Oh, here we are. Yes, could you unmute yourself, sorry? Is it Ronald? Hold on. There we go. We can hear you now. Oh, you've just muted yourself again. Sorry. That's you. Is that okay? Yes, we can hear you now. <clears throat> Apart from, uh, from, from Sitka Spruce, Apart from uh, uh, not having any deleterious effect by breeding for uh, stiffness uh, on the growth rate, would it uh, breeding for stiffness have any effect on the on the form of the tree? Uh, could it induce forking or heavy branching or something like that? Well, as far as I know, th there are no genetic correlation with forking or branch. Normally, uh, stiffness is more, is in some way related to um, density only, good density. But it seems to me that it could be possible to improve stiffness, mainly because the high heritability that have stiffness comparing with the different tribes like branches or uh, uh, strainness or density. Yes, and it wouldn't uh, uh, end up with a shorter, fatter trees or longer, narrower trees, slimmer trees. You know, in theory, the, the growth, it, it will be uh, independent and, and it will depend more of the size than something else. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Brian, will you, will you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. Um, just a question on the two provenances that had the, the greatest stiffness characteristics. Where were they located? Are they right down the very... Are they in Oregon or are they Alaska or whereabouts were they? You know, uh, um, I should show again that the, there are the good trees are independent of any provenance, are from the north to the south. So it's, it, there is no inclinal variation or a trend. It seems to be that there are good trees independently of the provenance. Okay. Gustavo, can I ask how long will, will your tree breeding um, program take before we see any positive results? Pardon, uh, I didn't understand the question. Okay, how, I mean, you're going to start this this um, initiative on improving stiffness. So when, how long before we actually see any results? How many years? Well, uh, we already uh, did the, the elite population. We, we need to regraft a bit more to reproduce the trees. And in three years, I think that we may establish on the ground and we may need another five years to produce pollen of those trees. And 
And after that, we may introduce into the breeding population and test which are the, the good one. So that's, if we are using the molecular markers, potentially in 10 years, we will be able to detect which are the good provenance or the, no, sorry, the, the good progenies that are having a strong effect in stiffness. So that's quite a lot quicker than we, it's taken in the past. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Gustavo, either on spruce, eucalyptus, or any other forest research tree breeding? I'm not seeing any hands. Yep, Brian. Um, uh, typically, uh, eucalyptus glaucasins, where are the, the provenances? That, have you focused on provenances where you're going to source the seed from? And are you going to source the seed from Australia or New Zealand or CSIRO? What are yeah. the thoughts on those provenances? No, the idea is uh, to get in touch with the, the national parks and, and explore trees from different provenance covering all the natural area in, in, uh, in <clears throat> New South Wales and also in Victoria. Part, part of the things that I've been doing is that uh, there are about five different provenances that I've been using for my seed collection and they are, some of them are more superior than others. So it'd be quite a good idea to, to catch up with the history that I've got so far. Yes, it could be a, a good contribution, but also, um, you know, mainly the difference between the provenance, it has a, a sort of overlap that really may contribute in some way with good genetic background, perhaps not the 70%, but with 10 or 20%, to contribute in, in giving more uh, diversity to the, the population for the UK. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Gustavo. I must remember that I'm chairing this. It's all really interesting, but I suppose we better move on to the next presentation. And if we have time at the end, we could ask additional questions if that's OK. Can I ask one more question to Gustavo? Or do you want to move? If, if, he, if he answers it very quickly, I've got to think of the, the next speakers. Yes, uh, in the past I planted uh, gummy eye, which was uh, killed by frost, and parvifolia, which has a very shallow root system and blew down. Uh, have you done any serious trials on, on either of those? Uh, aspects of growing eucalyptus? Uh, yes, uh, I've been working with eucalyptus intensively and something that I feel that we are missing here in the UK is a deep soil preparation for planting eucalyptus. So normally in most of the world there are a uh, reaping that's really uh, make that the roots go really deep and yes. just give a stability to the, the tree. Thank you. Yep. Caroline's just told me that we've put plenty of money in the meter so we can take as long as we want to ask questions. But um, <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much. And thanks, Gustavo. And it's good to, to see and, and hear you again and look forward to working with you in the future. So we can move on to the next presentation, please. It's uh, Joe Clark, who is Head of Research for Future Trees Trust. We've worked together for a number of years and uh, this is going to be a, a different approach looking at broadleaves. So over to you, Joe. Does that look okay? Great, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd like to start by thanking Andy and Caroline very much for inviting me to share some of the research that Future Trees Trust has been doing over the last 30 years with you tonight. Um, so our mission is to get improved seed of the two highest categories of FRM, that is qualified and tested, to market for the main commercial broadleaf species. And for us, this means what was ash before ash dieback, um, oak, chestnut, sycamore, and birch and cherry. 
And we do this through the identification of the very best parents through phenotypic selection, so what the tree looks like in situ. And we collect sign material uh, from those trees, which we then use to create clonal seed orchards. And by doing this, we are bringing together the best individuals and um, the seed arising from these seed orchards falls under the qualified category of FRM. And you can expect a three to five percent genetic gain above uh, using uh, selective material. But if we want to do slightly better, we have to collect seed and carry out progeny testing. And this is very long term and it's very expensive. So to date, we have uh, progeny trials for ash, oak and sycamore, but we're starting to do um, some progeny testing of birch too. Uh, we also work with many other partners to bring minor species to market. This is something we're, we're bigging up uh, as we go forward with uh, resilient woodlands and looking at where we're going to actually get these seeds from for, to help government meet its target of 30,000 hectares per year. Um, so some of these species like uh, wild service are going to be quite difficult to source genetically diverse populations. So that's something we're looking at. We also uh, are working with Forest Research funded by DEFRA to produce ash trees that are tolerant to ash dieback. This is a long term ongoing project and I will be uh, talking a bit more about that in a minute. But also we're a very small charity. There are many things that we want to do that we don't have the capabilities within house to do. So uh, we commission particular pieces of research uh, working with universities or if it's some molecular marker work, we don't have the capabilities within house to do that. So why do, we, why do we need to do this? Well, we were fortunate enough to go on a, a trip to the Netherlands a few years ago to look at their oak breeding program. And this is one of their um, seed stands. And here it's uh, seed has arisen from a, a, a stand where it's overgone a period of intense selection. And this is the result. This is dysgenic selection where the best trees have been removed and you're looking at, at the result. And this is no longer on their, their register because this is not how it is uh, desirable. But this is another seed stand. Uh, this one is on the register and this is a material that goes to market. And uh, something that was a surprise to us is that they put a lot of their seed stands out along roads. I just don't see this working in Britain personally because we have so much traffic, but this was a very fine example of how a seed stand could look and this makes very easy collection. So I'm going to focus on oak a bit more because we've got issues in the UK about uh, seed supply for acorns. As you all know, it masts very infrequently in the UK, typically four to seven years. On the register managed by um, Forest Research or Forestry Commission for uh, seed stands, the FRM register, there are 117 stands, 56 of those are in the select category, but many of these are not actually managed for acorn production. They're, they're not thin, so the crowns uh, are not wide and spreading, uh, which, which gets promotes good flowering, and the undergrowth isn't managed, which means collecting the acorns isn't, isn't um, easy, and therefore most of the stands are not actually collected from. Furthermore, oak is recalcitrant. This means that the, the, they can't be stored, so getting uh, a seed supply every year is really problematic. And this often results in acorns coming from the continent and sometimes from um, not, not near continent, so Eastern European seed sources. And these are maladapted to British conditions. So there's quite a, a problem here about seed supply of decent UK quality acorns for industry. And we need more managed select seed stands. Uh, we need to increase the <clears throat> research into acorn storage time. Uh, forest research are, are tackling this, but it's, it's not a straightforward problem. Um, we also need to promote uh, research for oak flowering because you, you obviously don't get an acorn crop if you haven't got a decent flower crop. So we've just taken on um, a PhD student, which is really exciting for us. This is Ryan McClory. He's um, based at Reading University and he's investigating drivers of oak masting in the UK. Uh, and some of the questions he's going to be investigating is how does the variation in climate, pollen and resources affect uh, acorn production on individual tree? Uh, what can we do to help improve acorn production? And how does acorn and seedling quality differ between mast and non-mast years? And can we, have, can we do things to improve the quality of the acorn or its longer term viability? And then also what are the climate determinants looking behind oak masting and this is looking at it at a landscape scale. 
So he's got quite a lot of issues there that he's going to be looking at um, and seeing why we don't get an acorn crop every year. Because the Netherlands report, they get an acorn crop every year. So why don't we? What is going on? Why do the acorns abort? Because it, it appears that the oak, the, the oak tree does flower every year, but this, the acorns don't develop. So we want to understand why that is. So <clears throat> the acorn supply is, is an issue. So what we're also doing is collecting um, oak, uh, oak science so that we can put out uh, clonal seed orchards for oak. But the problem with oak is that uh, a hectare of uh, clonal seed orchard will only ever produce enough acorns to reforest an area about twice its size because it doesn't mast every year. So we need lots of seed orchards. We also have a correlation between trees that have large vessel size associated with shake. Uh, and this is particularly a problem where you've got a fluctuating water table. So this is another piece of research we're investigating. But oak grafting is extremely difficult. Ash, you can take some cyan material and it grafts very easily. But oak is a real problem. So we're really struggling to get our clonal seed orchards up and running. And we even get incompatibilities sometimes several years after grafting. So there's quite a few issues there. So for a clonal seed orchard, this is what we would normally do. We'd normally shoot the top of the tree out with a shotgun and for ash and uh, sycamore, this works quite easily and you get this, this, um, these cyans. And if you can just see here, this is actually sycamore, but this is the material, this is the last year's growth that we're really interested in that we would then graft onto rootstocks. And you can see this is quite easy for sycamore, but oak, oak is a real problem. So we have to employ tree climbers. And these are the sort of trees. These are our phenotypically superior plus trees. And there we've got the climber going up one of our, our wonderful oak trees in the forest of Dean. Because it's so difficult to graft, we have to do it on what is called the hot pipe system. So this is a, a heating pipe. And here we've got our little scions grafted onto rootstocks. And this is the union in the pipe here. So that heat helps that callus formation. And then these are potted up and then a year well, at the end of the year, you've got a lovely one-year-old grafted uh, a seed, well, I'll say seedling, not a, uh, a, new, a new tree from this mature plus tree. And then we can plant these out in our clonal seed orchards. We're in the process of doing this. We are going to have three for uh, Quercus petraea and one for Quercus roba. And then we have an archive site at um, a woodland in Kent. So these trees uh, will get... Um, cut back so they, prov they provide a resource of scion materials for further grafting so it doesn't take a pile in at Backhouse Wood. But these were 2018 where we just started. It's a very expensive process. It's very long term. Um, not all our grafts take, quite a few fail. We're about 50-60% success rate. So it's a long term project and it, it, these orchards uh, will be hopefully finished next winter and we're probably looking at about 10 years time before we start realizing useful uh, quantities of acorn. So I'm just going to talk um, a little bit about ash because it's something I've been working on for a very long time. Um, ash was the species that Future Trees Trust first started to work on uh, starting way back in 1993 when we put out progeny trials for ash and uh, a project, you do your progeny testing and at the end of your testing period, you can then have, you can then, you, you know the genetic worth of your, of your trees that you're testing. You can rogue your uh, progeny trials and you can then turn them into uh, seed orchards of tested material. And in fact, this was what we did with ash. And we had the first uh, tested material for a broadleaf of ash in 2012. And then of course, uh, ash dieback came. So it was, uh, we couldn't actually use that material because of the ban on moving it. So, we a DEFRA approached us and said, what can you do about, about this? And we looked at the resource we've already got. So these are um, provenance trials that Forest Research put out in the 90s before uh, the arrival of ash dieback. We also have clonal seed orchards and archives for ash that Future Trees Trust put out. We also have the, the progeny trials that I mentioned that produce the tested seed. But also there was a controlled breeding program carried out by uh, the University of Oxford. And um, ash is actually dioecious. You have male and female uh, on different trees, but they forced um, ash to self. They collected pollen and selfed it and then planted out the resulting uh, trees. <clears throat> so that this from the Fraxigen program, this 2451S, it's a low heterozygosity individual which meant it was used by um, Richard Bugg's team at Queen Mary to sequence the genome of ash. 
and uh, that was very important because it's helped in the identification of markers for tolerance and that that work was reported in in nature so all of the this existing resource pre calara uh, but was brought together in the Living Ash project where we, we were looking to screen all this resource that existed pre Kalara. There's over 40,000 individual trees in, in that, in all those trials. So we were screening all of those <coughs> to try and find trees with tolerance to ash dieback, but also those in the wider environment. So there were 26 seed orchards, which we screened annually uh, across these different types of trials. And in the last year of the project, um, because obviously you can't select for tolerance until disease gets there. So in the last year of the project, we screened 12 sites uh, extensively, which was 21,000 trees. That's every single tree we looked at. And out of those, we selected 245 as really looking very healthy and tolerant. And that's about 1% of that population. And this is uh, an important number because this is uh, the number that's been promoted by other countries um, like Denmark, and Sweden when they've been when they've had the disease longer and they are also reporting about a 1% uh, of the population that has this higher tolerance to ash dieback. And while we were doing that forest research put out uh, mass screening trials so this was the material that was in the nurseries at the time when ash dieback hit. Uh, they put out 155,000 trees this was an astonishing achievement in four, across 14 sites during the spring of 2013 which had 10 British, two Irish and a European uh, provenance, plus um, the seed from the FTT breeding program. And they've screened those for, for every year uh, of their five year project. And although early on they found differences between sites and between provenances, towards the end of their five year program that, that difference broke down. And this is also quite interesting because again, it shows that this is a single tree trait um, and it's those individuals that we're looking for. And they've also found um, a small percentage of trees that are uh, looking really tolerant to ash dieback. And they also grafted those trees up. And just to sort of show the sort of trees we're looking at, this is um, a uh, Foxy Wood in Norfolk, which is a wildlife trust site. Um, and this is, I'm walking down a ride in midsummer and you can see how badly infected all those trees are, but you do a 180 and on the other side of the ride, you've got a very nice looking ash tree. Now this tree isn't completely healthy. You can see, if you can see my mouse, you can see um, some little twigs here in the crown, the canopy's a bit thin, but compared to all the other trees, if we go back and look at that, you can see that this is a site where there's a very high disease pressure and this tree's looking really good. So although not completely healthy, it's one of the best ones. So this would be a tree that we would select. <clears throat> and then in the winter, we go back and we collect signs uh, these public sites, a lot of these, so we couldn't shoot, unfortunately, so we had to use long armed pruners, and that's my colleague there doing that. And there's a bag of cuttings which went off to East Morling Research in uh, Kent to do the grafting. And this is what it looked like in January 2018. You can see along the top there trees that the Living Ash Project selected, and on the bottom, those are the trees from the mass screening trial. We grew them for a year. And then this January in 2020, we planted them out um, uh, on the public forest estate uh, as, a, as an archive for carrying on screening. So we were funded originally by DEFRA for five years, as were um, forest research. And now both those projects have come together in, in a second phase, Living Ash Project. So this, this public archive here contains the trees from both projects and DEFRA have funded us again for another five years to carry on screening this, this archive. There, we're going to carry on monitoring forest researchers' ash trials. FARA have come in now and they're doing something called liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, where we take 50 trees of known uh, high susceptibility and 50 trees of high tolerance. They build a model and then we can <clears throat> high density throughput of all these trees in our archive so that it'll say, uh, is it actually, it's like a chemical fingerprint rather than a DNA fingerprint. And it will give us um, some, uh, a second uh, piece of information onto the tolerance of these trees. <clears throat> All these trees are grafted. There is evidence that trees can get infected through the lenticels. Um, and that's because they're grafted. There's no guarantee that the rootstock is tolerant. 
So Cure also looking at developing techniques of veg props so that uh, going forward we can get tolerant trees on their own roots because at the moment that's not uh, the success rate of that's only again about 50% and we need that to be a lot higher. So we have a project website I'd uh, encourage you to go and have a look. <clears throat> The trees at this site, this archive site, we already know they're not all as tolerant as we would hope they could be. Um, it's, it's a lot of progress very quickly, but the natural selection pressure is not as high as it could have been. So on our project website, there is a data sheet there and the people on this, on this call are the sort of people we really want you to get involved in. If you're managing woodlands or you know of a, a tree that is looking really healthy, in amongst other highly affected trees. These are the trees we really want to know about so that we can uh, supplement the archive site with better, more tolerant trees. So I'm just gonna quickly go on to some strategy stuff because tree, Future Trees Trust, we're a really small charity. We only employ two researchers and um, tree breeding is long-term and it's quite expensive. So we have to work in partnership with lots and lots of organizations and people and we do this through the National Tree Improvement Strategy, which was launched in, I want to say 2017, it might have been 2018. But the, the strategy was written between Forest Research, Future Trees Trust with Comfor, and it aims to promote UK trees through selection and breeding of a wide range of species. So this isn't just broadleaves, this is all trees, uh, native, non-native, conifer and broadleaves. And it's to look at the economic value and the genetic diversity, because this is all about species and, and, and resilience, woodland resilience and treescapes. And we ensure that this selected material is available to all interested parties. So anybody who's got an interest in, in a clonal seed orchard, any nursery can approach any member and ask for, for um, access to that material. And that's the project website and you can go on there and you can see our action plan. So the action plan is it's broad ranging. It's a lot of it's aspirational. Some of it's what we're doing. Some of it's what we want to do. Should we have lots and lots of money or should some uh, wealthy donor want to give us some to do something of particular interest? The other strategy I want to touch on is this was launched in 2018. So this is this almost sits above the NTIS strategy. Um, because this is a strategy for UK forest genetic resources. And UK forest genetic resources are actually quite uh, understudied and underutilized. And we came up with five main topics, a collaboration for change to make people think about UK forest genetic resources. What have we got? What is the provenance? What are we planting? Where's it coming from? Uh, I think a lot, lot more needs to be done here. And this needs to be communicated much more widely so that more people are aware of the importance of forest genetic resources. So uh, we're looking at new research and coordination of the existing knowledge. And we're also looking at in situ conservation. And this is done through Euphagen, the U uh, European Forest Genetic Resources Network. And this is done via gene conservation units. Um, and I'll come on to that a bit more in a minute and also ex situ conservation. So that's where uh, the work of FTT really comes in. This is our seed orchards and archives. And that strategy is also available online and also has a, an action plan. And one of the things of that action plan is bringing this all together. So this is an, a neat piece of work that Future Trees Trust have done in fact this year, and this is still a work in progress. And I was hoping to um, show you this live. It's an interactive map, but unfortunately we've just had some funding to develop it a bit further and the developer is um, working on it, so it's not live at the moment. So I've just got a few screen grabs. But the, it's this interactive map, and you can see on the left-hand side all the different types of trials that we've got, um, provenance trials, progeny trials, seed orchards, etc. and these genetic conservation units. Um, if I go on again, so each, you can see it's all clustered by groups, and you can select your tree species. Now, at the moment, this is just broadleaves. This is just FTT's work with a few FR trials um, for the genetic conservation side of things. We're very much hoping to get the tree breeding uh, trials of forest research on here too. But we can then scroll in and we can see here is one of the ash trials. So it tells you what's there, what year it was planted, the design of the trial and all the data sets held so that anybody anywhere in the world can see all of the resource that Britain has got what is out there, what data is held, what publications are held, and who to contact to get access to that data so that we can make um, what we've got much more readily available to everybody should anybody want to use it. 
And I mentioned the genetic conservation units. And at the moment, this is it. We've got one in Scotland for Scots pine. Um, and this has been hampered due to COVID. There are actually quite a few more now um, that have been trying to go through the process of registration. And I think those will be coming online soon. So I mentioned we got a bit of extra money. If we go back to this map, this is, if you like, the production side of things and the using genetic resources. The extra money is to create a second map that we'll have for the um, genetic conservation units. And we're going to add in um, Q's native tree seed project collection sites. And this will be a real neat addition because if we're looking for minor species like the wild service and, and these sorts of species, it will show where we know there are thoxinous populations that we can go and look for plus trees. So it will be a really neat project bringing all the UK forest genetic resources together in one place. Uh, oh, and this just shows the, the plus trees. If we have over 1400 plus trees um, across the broadleaf species, this is only for broadleafs, and you can see that there, uh, there's quite a lot of them, and this is just the oak ones that we're seeing here. So what have we actually achieved so far? The FTT have been around for 30 years. We've got uh, 14,000 plus trees across our six main commercial species. There are 147 registered uh, seed stands register uh, of FRM, but I think we need more of these, particularly when we're trying to um, bring more seed to market to meet this challenging tree, tree planting targets. We've got clonal seed orchards. This is qualified FRM where we're looking at five to eight maybe 10% genetic gain for sycamore, chestnut, birch, cherry and ash. We're planting them for oak and downy birch is just coming. And we've got progeny trials, which will eventually yield tested material for ash, oak and sycamore. Silver birch are also coming online. So that's, that these are some of our hard achievements in the, in the last 30 years. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, to say you're a, a small charity and there's only two researchers, you've certainly done plenty, that's for sure. Lots of output. Okay, folks, we're, um, we're a bit tight for time, but um, there's time for one or two questions of Joe, if you um, would like to ask. Anyone has any? No? Uh, yes? The uh, map, maps and... Uh, resources that you showed Joe at the end are very interesting. I think it would additionally be useful if you on that uh, information uh, website, it would be useful if you could publish those nurseries that are actually selling selected or improved uh, transplants if part of the aim of the main aim uh, of all these programs is to get uh, the knowledge out into the uh, yeah of practitioners and growers yeah. actually we, we did we did consider that norman the trouble is um it then becomes promoting individual commercial nurseries and um some of this is being done with public money and um it's not really okay to promote an individual commercial company. Um, but we are, we, and, and it's, it's a big um, uh, partnership project as well. So CEH, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and Q particularly um, can't be seen to be promoting commercial uh, people. But we're, we at FTT are also working on something which we're calling, it's a clumsy title, but deploying FTT material. So we do have a number of seed orchards and there are a number of commercial nurseries and seed merchants who have orchards, who host orchards and who do sell that material. And it, we're, not, we're not yet quite ready for publication, but we're, we're drafting um, the use of, of our material and which tackles um, questions about genetic diversity within populations. And then for each seed orchard, we'll be producing, um, uh, this is where we think it's okay to plant material arising from this orchard. And we'll, we'll be giving those to the nurseries and hoping that they'll put those out too. But there's a slight commercial sensitivity about it. So, uh, yeah. Well, it seems to be a bottleneck there, so, as far as I can see. Uh, mm. uh, because, uh, you know, it's... Uh, the sooner 
approved or selected material is out of, for, for landowners to, to buy. Uh, it's just uh, research for the sake of research. No, there is there is material out there. There are several nurseries who who do um, promote it. Um, I don't I don't think I'd better suggest particular ones. But certainly, if you go to the, the some of the larger um, forest nurseries, it's on their website and it, it mentions the work of Future Trees Trust. And um, one or two of them actually say this is this is seed from FTT seed orchards. It is a piece of work we we internally need to do to promote all the others to do that. But it is, it, the material is there. Uh, I think, for example, cherry, it's the demand for cherry is fully met through FTT improved material. And uh, we, we the, 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 the sycamore, we, the, the orchards are quite young, so it, they're not producing all that much qualified material yet. But uh, the uptake is good and what is available is, is sold. So it's, the, some of these orchards are quite young and it's we have to wait for the seed to come online in decent quantities so there's a little bit of a chicken and egg you can't shout about it too much because if you do people will want that material and it might not they might not be able to get it uh, that, sorry one more thing that's another point in your list of species that you're uh, mm. working on cherry mm. isn't mentioned it it was sorry i may have missed mentioned it but cherry is being worked on it is mentioned I mean, you, you've got the oak ash, sycamore, birch, uh, etc., but not, uh, not cherry. We have clonal seed orchards for cherry. I'm sorry if I've missed it off the list, Norman, but we do have several seed orchards for cherry, as, as you know, having been the cherry chairman. I do know, yes. But, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. If we can move on to the, the third presenter, this evening we've got uh, Tim Widden, who is Forestry Director of Tell Hill, and he is one of the founding members of the Conifer Breeding Co-op, and he's going to share with us their, their current activities looking to improve veg prop for Sitka spruce for the future. That's you, Tim. Good. Yeah. Hopefully uh, that's good. Um, Introduce myself, Tim Lydon, uh, Director of Conifer Breeding Co-op, uh, found a member in uh, February 2014, I think it was. Um, and on the left here are some uh, full sibling material showing the better value. So the objectives of the Conifer Breeding Co-op are to ensure that there is adequate supply of improved veg prop sitka for uh, for growers, and also taking forward breeding programs uh, in for Sitka spruce, Douglas fir, Norway spruce, or Western red cedar and Western hemlock, so the, the, the major uh, productive species uh, in Conifer. So what are we talking about in terms of quality improvement? Um, the, the graph here is one that Steve Lee uh, left me with. Um, on the, the, the yellow line is a natural uh, distribution from a natural population. And as we start breeding, uh, you can see the, the gains uh, increasing, moving to the right, uh, and the normal curves coming in a bit narrower. Uh, so we're well versed with Sitka seed orchards uh, and now we're pretty well versed with full sibling um, Sitka. Uh, but there is then a question as to uh, does one go clonal or not? Um, but that's probably not to be answered today. If we look at where Sitka has come from, there was a tremendous amount of breeding post 1960s uh, and then in the early 2000s we saw uh, a number of seed orchards come into fruition. Let's um, see what we find in, in here. Uh, NT11, A12, A13 and A14 uh, which we're pretty well familiar with. Uh, good uh, increases in growth, uh, stem diameter. Um, and 
lower density, not necessarily particularly good, but the straightness here is starting to get straight, straighter trees. If we drop down uh, below that, uh, the new genetic gain figures, which have been re-evaluated, uh, the two newest um, seed orchards, uh, are what I would call A21 and A22, um, are giving us modest diameter growth, positive increase in density, but then we're starting to see this most important one uh, in terms of stem form. If we look at uh, the veg prop program, uh, so half siblings and full siblings, the half sibling material came onto the market again in the early 2000s. Uh, the moo numbers, uh, increasing growth, density there or thereabouts, but again, seeing the straightness uh, coming out. Those were the, the um, uh, improvements that um, we were looking at in, in those early days. If we drop down to the bottom right now, looking at the 2010s, uh, we have full sibling material uh, from control crosses in uh, seed orchards. And you can see that uh, the straightness characteristics are much, much better. Um, and, and that I think is going to be, to allow us to use Sitka in more valuable places because the material is going to be that much better. Um, and you can see the branching um, as well, a couple of low ones there, but equally well, some good uh, higher ones. So these, these figures all relate to the percentage gain or loss compared to unimproved sicker. So it's just worth looking back on uh, what the UK forest market said in 2020. Um, the, the graphs at the bottom right uh, are in uh, years. So the brown year is 2020. Um, where you're suddenly seeing this rapid increase in value of young plantations. Um, and then the value actually dropping down um, in the year 40. So what's happening there? Um, these forests are now at a stage where the vigor and the quality of the improved stock is readily apparent. So this is us. Uh, the, the, the industry um, being able to take uh, advantage of the science. So looking at a couple of full siblings on uh, one of the sites, the um, PF81 uh, and PF96 are showing yield class 30 and improved straightness, 25% straightness on the original QC. QCI plant. So what does this allow us to do? It allows us to uh, fell earlier or take um, more volume off in a longer period. I should add there's been quite a lot of work on uh, yield class. Um, so these increases in yield class, uh, when I first started in Southwest Scotland, the average yield class was probably around about 16. Um, that was an understatement. So uh, forest research have recalculated um, the yield class models. So partly is that part of the yield class 30 that we're now suggesting comes from uh, a re-evaluation of the yield classes. Some uh, improvement in second generation, but the vast majority of the increase has got to be from tree breeding. And that is now being evidenced uh, in the marketplace. We've been looking at genetic diversity uh, in the conifer breeding, um, an interesting 
to date. Uh, the map on the uh, left there is uh, about a thousand hectare forest in Estelmuir uh, that has been now totally restructured uh, with a mixture of seed orchard uh, and half and full siblings. Question is, which has uh, greater gen gen genetic diversity? The original QCI uh, or what we have restocked with? The, the debate comes from the fact that uh, QCI or Haida Kwai these days, uh, seed was often collected from a narrow base. Uh, they used to take the seed from the easiest places. Versus many of the plus trees that were collected had a much wider geographical area. Um, we need to learn how to use them wisely. So the, um, the co-op has funded a PhD into genetic diversity uh, for which uh, Gustavo Lopez is um, working hard with Richard Enos and Joan Cottrell to support uh, a PhD into monitoring and managing genetic diversity in Sitka spruce. Um, this was a good collaboration between the co-op, academia, forest research, uh, Baylor Forest Nurseries and uh, Till Hill and the forest owners. So hopefully next year we will have the results from this and then be able to use the information more wisely. Another PhD is been looking at uh, frost damage. In the spring of 2015, uh, across the Scottish borders and down into the Northwest uh, in April, there was some quite dramatic frosts that didn't just singe the tips, but it was taking whole trees out and killing uh, the leaders. So the PhD was set up to identify molecular markers for spring, spring frost tolerance. Why uh, spring frost? Because that's where we get uh, the main damage. So this graphic here uh, would be normal um, where you are getting damaged side branches. Uh, during the winter. In this scenario, what's happening is the temperature uh, rises in the early spring, and that allows all the least frost tolerant, frost resistant trees uh, to effectively lose their frost tolerance. And that's when you get the high leader damage. So you get this warm, early warmth, and then the sudden frost, that's what's giving us the damage. So within the PhD, uh, they were able to uh, detect particular genotypes um, that have a shallow slope on the, on the graphs. Uh, and these are cold resistance genotype. And then on the uh, right hand side, the steep slope is cold susceptible genotypes. So again, this work hasn't quite been finished, but it does allow us to um, identify areas where more work needs to be done because with the climate change, and this, this is a classic climate change uh, issue that we need to address. Other work that the co-op has been doing is uh, DNA fingerprinting using microsatellite technology. Uh, and this allows people to check what they're actually getting. So they could take a branch or some needles off the crops that they have been sold or bought even, 
um, and then we can tell what the material came from, what crosses, whether it was a seed orchard or um, full sibling, etc. We've also been looking at genomics, uh, supporting the Sitka Spruced um, re sponsored research, research uh, looking to develop genomic prediction for Sitka, which will help us get earlier returns from tree breeding. We currently embarked on a plus tree identification, uh, looking throughout the UK for plus trees in Norway spruce and Western red cedar. Uh, if anybody has uh, specific stands of those two species that they think are really good, please drop us an email and uh, we'll have a look at those. We're also setting up provenance trials uh, this year with Norway spruce, having got samples from uh, lots of different uh, countries and also uh, from our own so that we can then see how they fare relative to one another and then that will allow us to create a breeding population. So what's, what are we looking uh, at, uh, of what are our, our objectives? We're trying to align the tree breeding objectives within uh, industrial needs. That's a great opportunity. So we, Gustavo was talking earlier about um, uh, stiffness uh, and his re new research will ably hit that spot. We also want to de develop a long-term vision for the conifer breeding. Um, and that will lead us to integrate multiple breeding objectives to give an index selection. Uh, we need to deliver the vision, uh, which will help fill in some of the knowledge gaps and develop and implement new technologies, engaging with the forest sector. We're also working on a new membership model so that we can be more inclusive. And that's what I have to say. Uh, email info at conifercoop.co.uk uh, will reach us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. It was a great insight into the work of the Conifer Breeding Co-op. As um, once Tim comes off his slideshow, are there any questions for Tim? Silence. <laughs> I, I've got one because um, it's becoming one of my favourite trees, the Western Hemlock. You're doing work on that too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we have limited resource, um, and Norway spruce um, and Western red cedar seem to be the one next ones to knock off, but then uh, Western uh, Hemlock will come after them. Okay, thanks. Could could I ask a question? Yes. Um, so I have a stand of uh, Sitka spruce and Douglas fir, about fifty year old, only about two hectares. I'm interested in continuous cover systems. How relevant? But going back to your frost damage slide, how relevant if I've got regenerating young trees, uh, is is frost damage to continuous cover systems? Oh, I would I would guess that uh, if you're doing continuous cover, then you will have some some shelter over that uh, region, uh, and thus hopefully uh, they would be less less susceptible because of the reduced exposure. That would be my guess, anyway. Good news. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions, observations? No? Okay. Thanks, Tim. Okay. As we move on now, um, Caroline sent out her manager's report, uh, I think it was a couple, two or three days ago, 
uh, this is an opportunity for you to ask Caroline if there's any, anything specific within that report. Any questions or observations? It's very comprehensive. I, I won't be offended if there isn't, because you can all email. It is very relevant to England rather than those Scottish um, colleagues we have online. So um, if you do have any questions, feel, feel free to just email me as we are getting short of time. You know where I am, caroline at comfort.org.uk. Okay. Well, this is all you've got off lately, Caroline. And uh, maybe we'll, you'll get 20 emails later on tonight. Well, unless there's any other business, anyone got any more any comments for any of the speakers or no? Okay, well, I think it's time then to, to thank you very much for taking time tonight to, to join us. And a special thanks. Uh, to all the speakers, to Gustavo, to Joe, and to Tim. And uh, we'll be in touch in the new year with uh, a programme of, of webinars that hopefully we'll uh, manage to um, promote a bit wider and get uh, a greater uh, audience. But um, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, goodbye. Very welcome. Bye. Bye.